Sprouls. I'm clinical professor of marketing and one of the creators of Maryland Business Rebooted. I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Kim, for program coordinator. Nicole will help moderate any questions you may have for our panelists today. We ask you to stay muted during the lecture, but we welcome any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Um, I'm also joined by Marilyn Smith, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs and Diversity Officer, Dr. Victor Mullins. Welcome, Victor. Thank you. Our, and our special guest today is Andy Shalal, founder and CEO of Bus Boys and Poets, a community gathering place. Andy is an artist, an activist, an entrepreneur, and a restaurateur. We're also proud to note that Andy is a Smith alum, um, a 2019 graduate of our executive MBA program. Welcome, Thank Andy. You. Thank you. Um, Andy, it's really great to have you with us today, as well as you, Dr. Mullins. And um, I'm going to ask Victor to get us to get our conversation with Andy started. Go ahead and take it away, Victor. Thank you, Judy. Andy, can you tell us something about Bus Boys and Poets? Uh, how did you get the idea? The concept, we know it's a green restaurant that's also a bookstore, a fair trade market, a venue for music and poetry. When did you start the concept and just bring us to where we are now? Well, the concept has been brewing in my mind probably for decades, I would say. And I always wanted a place that can be a gathering space, a place that brings people together, talk about issues. You know, I, I've been a, um, a um, real, um, I had a real interest in the in the salons of the late 1800s in Paris and the left bank and you know the idea that he can bring people together talk about stuff you know Socratic conversations about every kind of issue you can imagine and restaurants are really ideal for that they're places where people come to eat and so it attracts a lot of different types of people everyone eats so everyone shows up and then you have these great conversations and this collision that happens sometimes between the politics and the conversation and the art and the culture and sparks fly every which direction and it's exciting. So I always wanted a place that really uh, fits that kind of aura, that feeling. Uh, and I wanted it to be in DC and of course, having you know lived and grown up here in, uh, in this area and in, in DC for most of my life, um, it, was, it was something that I thought would be great to have, a place that can actually gather different walks of life, uh, different types of people, different types of professions and so on. People from all different, uh, you know, avenues of, of, of culture and politics and, and uh, employment and everything else to come together under one roof uh, to be able to um, kind of find some commonality, find their interests and align their interests maybe together and maybe work on issues that they think are important. As I saw the city was changing and gentrifying so rapidly, I wanted to have that kind of a place that can actually bring people together and create that sense of DC that I think oftentimes is not something that we, uh, we talk about a lot because when people think of DC, they're thinking of the federal government, they're thinking of the White House, they're not thinking of the actual city itself. And you know, I, I know the city has so much more to offer and wanted a place that represents that. So how was the first year? Judy, I'm gonna ask a few more questions. And Go then for it. Turn it over to you. So kind of walk us through that first moment of opening. Well, you know, the first moment of opening is always uh, very scary. And I've opened many, many restaurants since then. Uh, but each one is equally scary as the other one. It's, it never goes away. That sense of, of uh, unknown, the sense of uh, excitement, the sense of you don't know you're going to open the door, you don't know who's going to show up, uh, if anyone. Uh, I think that's always there. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, anytime I have an event, I'm always thinking no one's going to come. So that, you know, that's, that's like my, like, that's my default. Uh, I am very insecure about business and I'm always thinking in terms of what can I do more? What can I do better? What can I do to make sure that people show up? So yeah, opening, opening was really, really tough. I've opened other restaurants before and I've had some, uh, some moments where I've, I, I had a place called Skewers many years ago where I had this idea of a Middle Eastern restaurant that was going to do the same kind of idea, bringing people together, different walks of life, so on. Uh, and I uh, had the idea in my head, and and I worked so hard, and I put the art, and I put the work, you know, on the walls, and I made sure the bar was perfect, made sure the food was perfect, all this. And we opened the door, and like literally, no one showed up. We were doing maybe like twenty covers a night, and it was very, very scary. It wasn't until uh, the uh, 
the food editor of the Washington Post walked in and gave us a very brief view that we started to take off. And I've always told her that this used to be Phyllis Richmond. Some people may remember who that is. Uh, Phyllis Richmond was there before, you know, social media and all the other stuff, but she was like the queen of, of food reviews or restaurant reviews. If she, if she gave you a positive review, you were like off to the races. If she panned you, you were like, you might as well close and start over again. You know, <laughs> so I was like, my heart was pounding when she walked in. I remember she wrote the article. It was a beautiful article, so wonderful. And uh, we really took off to the races from there. But had it not been for her, and I told her this one time, I, I saw her at a party and I said to her, I said, it, was, it wasn't for you, I would probably be a professor somewhere teaching something. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what have been my second choice of a profession. But, uh, but it's, uh, when I opened Bus Boys and Poets, I had that knowledge in mind where you can't just keep the idea inside your head. You have to share it. You have to tell people about it. You have to get feedback. You have to... Uh, you know, are vetted, you have to ask lots of questions. And so I went out in the community and went to every different ANC meeting. I went to, uh, you know, ho apartment, uh, you know, concierges. I went to hotels. I went to, told them about what I'm, what I'm doing. So we opened, it was more of a bullseye. It was more kind of, uh, you know, we, we, we got busy fairly soon and it started to take off fairly quickly. And it was because I did my homework to make sure I aligned it exactly as I had wanted uh, to see it happen. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Judy? That's, that's awesome. As a marketing professor, I love to hear that. It's like you actually went out to look what the customer's wants and needs were and then, you know, kind of merged that with your dream. How much did your dream have to change as you gathered information from the community or was, was it maybe just satisfying that community's needs that were really part of your dream? Yeah, I mean, having lived in the community for a long time I, and, and being part of the community, I sort of knew what was missing. And what was missing was, 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 a, was a space that is a gathering space that does more than just food. Because a lot of times when you go out, you know, it's a process. Some people may have to get babysitters. Some people have to, you know, go home, get dressed up, you know, come back out and stuff. You don't want to have to be moving your car around several times. You don't want to go to a restaurant then get back in the car drive and that was before uber and all these other things by the way it, yeah. you, you didn't want to get back in the car go somewhere else find a parking space park go maybe to see a show or a movie or something i wanted a place that has a little bit of all that so like during the week when it's not like you know you're you're seeing a major production in the theater or or something like that you just want some entertainment some kind of sense of community some kind of you know something or another maybe some poetry maybe a little music maybe a book reading or something like that wouldn't it be nice to combine all those things in one space where you can sit there and have a nice glass of wine and listen to an author talking about a wonderful book? I mean, that's a night, right? Uh, yeah. It was interesting because we were actually voted one of the best place for first date because I found out the reason why is because you can actually meet somebody there that you haven't met before. Maybe you met them online or something. You'd say, meet me at the bookstore. So they show up at the bookstore, you're having conversation. If it goes well, you can have a seat, have maybe a drink. If it goes better, maybe you can order dinner. If it goes better, maybe you can go see a show inside inside the theater space that we have in the back. So it kind of has multiple layers, or you can just end the conversation at the bookstore without having to commit. You know, if you're gonna meet them like at Morton's or Clyde's or something like that, you basically committed to dinner, you know? Yeah. And you basically stuck with that person for an hour, maybe more, uh, and uh, not wanting to be there. So this actually made it much much nicer for people to sort of get to meet one another. I know when I have family in town, I like to take them down there because because of that thing. Like we can have lunch, but we also can shop in the bookstore. And it also, to me, just really gives them a sense of what DC is yes. and what DC is yeah. about. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, you know, kind of pivoting then. So to me, so much about of Busboys and Poets is about this sense of space and the sense of community, both inside your store and where your and where your 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 restaurants are, are located. So when, you know, us all coming together became a problem under COVID, um, you've talked, you've used the term that you had to pivot so much, you felt like you were becoming a ballerina. Um, can you talk about how some of the thought processes and, and incarnations you went through? Well, I'm, I'm of the mind that if you're a community space, you need to be there when the community needs you. So I, I remember back when 9-11 happened, back, I think it was 2001, right? Yeah, I think 2001, when 9-11 happened, um, I, was in, I was taking a class somewhere in downtown DC and then the class was dismissed 
and we went out in the street and it was about 9 30 in the morning and everybody was walking around in days and i had two restaurants at that time i had a place called mimi's uh, which was a community space as well and a place called luna grill and diner and they were not far from one another and i remember walking to luna grill and i saw you know lots of people inside and the manager there was saying what are we going to do what are we going to do i said we're going to stay open we're going to provide free food and free drink to everybody that walks in the door because that's what we do so he says really that's what i said yeah i said you know people are going home and you know, I, I noticed there was a Starbucks next door. The, the minute it happened, there was a sign on the door saying closed. Uh, every other place was going closed, closed, closed. And we were like the only place. So people were lining up and we had a radio on and we put the radio on for people to listen. So it was a really cool spot for people to come together and be part of a community as opposed to just walking in a daze in the street. Then I walk over to Mimi's, my other place, the same thing. Lots of people inside. We, you know, the, the, uh, the manager wasn't sure what to do. I said, we're going to stay open. We're going to provide free food, free drinks. Anybody that can, you know, that can't afford it or doesn't have money, whatever, whatever, just put the food out there. Let people just come in. And we did. And it was a really cool thing that gave us back so much uh, in, the, in the long run. People were, were so grateful because they couldn't go home. You know, transportation was stuck. Yeah. People, you know, uh, traffic was awful. So people just kind of waited it out there where they were able to call their family or whatever, we let them use our phone, et cetera. So all of that, I think, happened. So when this happened, when the pandemic happened, it wasn't like we were prepared. I have not been prepared for a pandemic, don't get me wrong. But, but the idea of staying open was really key. And whatever that looked like, you know, of course, my being mindful not to jeopardize, you know, people's lives and health and all of that, you know, we made sure that we were able to maintain a light there. Just, you know, keep a light on. So whatever it is, whether it's two people, whether it's six people, whatever it is, we had to keep the light on. And so that really helped us to kind of shape and figure out where we needed to go next. Because I have friends that are in, in, in the business that they closed right away. And it took them a real long time to get back on their feet because this, as this, you know, continued to drag on, people realizing this isn't going to be a short thing. We have to get back on our feet. And so it took them much longer to get back on their feet as, uh, as we did, because we were really prepared uh, to be able to um, make whatever adjustments are necessary. And the only way we can figure that out is by being open a little bit and figuring out what areas that people needed to uh, us to respond to. Obviously, the carryout became a huge deal. So we made sure our technology was up to speed. We made sure that we were connected with all these different services to make deliveries. We made sure that our POS system was well managed and well uh, you know, tuned with our, with our delivery processes. And all that really helped us to move much quicker forward. And, you know, I would, I would say at this point, maybe with some certainty that we're not going anywhere, that, that we're going to stay. So, so that's, a, that's a great thing. That wasn't the feeling I had maybe three months ago, you know? So I think those types of things really help. Andy, uh, you know, I, I'm listening to you and you just bring such positive energy and I'm still reflecting on the moment you said that you have a lot of insecurities. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Do you still have insecurities? I am the most insecure person you'll ever want to meet. Um, I, I am constantly doubting and constantly questioning and constantly figuring out if I'm doing the right thing. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I, I used to think of that as a, as a weakness that I had to overcome. Now I realize that's really a strength uh, in, in many ways because once you become complacent, once you become, um, you know, kind of... Uh, you know, you think you got it all, you think you figured it all out, I think you really can fall uh, really quickly then and you become irrelevant. Uh, the idea of constantly thinking in terms of like, I can do better, I can be better, I can think differently, I can look for uh, alternative ways of seeing things, I think really keeps you uh, on your toes. It also wears you out sometimes, uh, clearly, you know, I think at times, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's, uh, it's challenging to be able to always think in terms of you know, I'm not good enough. I need to be better. You know, I think that's, that's not an uncommon uh, thing. I think people sometimes, you know, look in the mirror and say, I'm good enough. I'm great. I'm amazing. You know, that's nice. That's good. I'm glad you do that. But I, I like to think in terms of, I look in the mirror and see, what can I do better? Well, are you looking at it for more definitely of a 
good to great mentality? Absolutely, absolutely. That was one of my favorite books, actually. One of my favorite business books is, is, is the idea of, of, you know, a good is the enemy of great sometimes, right? Where, where people think I'm good enough and, you know, before you know it, you know, I always used to say the worst thing you can do is have a great idea and execute it badly. Uh, because that's really, that's opening up a door for somebody else to say, that's a great idea. I think I'm going to take it and do it much, much better. And suddenly you become irrelevant because they've done it so much better. Um, so I think that's, that's an important lesson. Okay. I just have another question uh, related to Andy. Uh, and that is, um, what do you think drove this inspiration for you to want to bring community together. I mean, it seems like you founded well, the bus bars and ports on that concept. Well, I, you know, I grew up in this country. I came as a child. I did not belong. I was different uh, than the other kids, you know, racially, ethnically, everything else. I was different, uh, you know, and when we came in this country back in the late 60s, um, I was just starting to begin middle school. Um, and I was, I was actually, when I started middle school, I was 10. Uh, and, and it was because, because of the school system they had. And anyway, uh, so, so being really young and being in a, in a, in a school that's different and, and feeling very different and not knowing where you fit in because this country is very racial, uh, as we know. Uh, so you're, you know, especially in school, you know, you have the white kids sit on one table and you have the black kids sit at another table. And then there's, the other kids who don't know where to sit uh, and end up really kind of feeling the sense of um, uh, not belonging, you know, the sense of otherness. And I always wanted to create a space where people can feel like they belong no matter who they are. And creating spaces like Busboys and Poets, I thought really kind of meet that, that, that challenge of, you know, having people from different backgrounds, different ages, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic status, different races, everything can actually come together and each one can find their space there. Uh, we do that through the books we do, through the art we have on the wall, through the staff we hire. Everyone should feel like when they walk in the door that they have themselves there, they see themselves somewhere in there. So that was kind of the inspiration for me, really wanting to find a place that I personally can feel very comfortable walking into. Uh, because I knew there are many people like myself who want to have those types of spaces. That's actually a really good uh, a thought. You know, I, I grew up in a household, this is a small house, and my mom, who passed away a couple of years ago, she opened her house up. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm one of six people, and I, I was thinking, boy, every time I turn around, I see a stranger in my house. Um, and and her thought was, if you build a, this environment where people are always in tune to coming and getting inspiration, it comes back on you full fold. And she wasn't doing it on that purpose, but it seems mm -hmm. like you continue to be blessed because you are a blessing for others. So that's, that's, that's my true. thought when I was It thinking. is true. I'm, I'm surrounded by the coolest people ever. Uh, you know, I, I love what I do. Uh, and uh, yes, I think people really appreciate it. And it's, it's just wonderful to be able to like exactly like you said, when you open it up, it comes back to you in so many ways. Judy? Yeah, so we have a question from the audience, um, from one of our participants, audience probably isn't the right word. Um, goodness, Ihekwemi, I'm sorry, Ihekwemi, excuse me, pronunciation, um, ask, how do you stay motivated, Andy? Uh, you know, it's it's the small battles sometimes that really keep you going. Uh, I, you know. A, a, Sometimes, you know, people look at the big picture and they think, oh my God, you know, something is so overwhelming. I mean, if you really think about the pandemic, you know, uh, six months ago and thinking like, you know, here it is, really the world just stopped and uh, in business, you can't stop and you've got rent to pay and you've got payroll to make and you have, you know, all these obligations that you have to take care of. And, and suddenly, you know, everything just comes to a, a dead halt. Um, you know, you start looking for small battles and, and winning them. And I think the, you know, you focus on the, on, on the little stuff, you know, uh, that's really what gets you motivated is I, I have exciting things that happen almost every single day that keep me going for the entire day. You know what I mean? Like, so always have one thing that I know is going to be like the coolest thing I'm going to do that day. Uh, and, and that really is enough sometimes to keep you going to do the other stuff that you have to do that you may not want to do 
but you do have to do. So I think that that really keeps me excited. I mean, I always look forward to something new for instance, I'm doing these Zoom calls with all these cool people, you know, that I'm that I'm that I'm involved with. And I look forward to those. So these keep me excited. So, uh, you know, having a meeting with someone, this, this webinar made me excited, you know, it's like, so all these, all these little moments that happen throughout the day, kind of almost like stepping stones that get you across, you know, the, uh, the ravine, so to speak. And then I'm sure at some point you look back and say, wow, I was over there and now I'm over yeah, Exactly. Here. I mean, yeah. that's the amazing part, right? Because you, 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 if you imagine the goal, it's always really hard to get started. Like I, I went and got my business degree, what, at the age of 62, uh, you know? So, so for me, it was like, okay, who does that? Like not many people, right? So I, if I had thought about the amount of work I had to do, I would have said, um, excuse me, I would have said, this is not for me, this, I can't do this. And so, so, but, you know, and I remember, I remember the first few weeks, I'm thinking like, you're crazy. Like, why did you even get yourself into this? You know, you got a business to run, you got family to take care of, you got stuff to do. And you're doing this, like so much work. Oh my goodness, you know, and, it, you know, papers and tests and all this. And I, and thinking back at it, if I had thought about how much work it was going to take, I would have never started. You know what I mean? Like, so you just put one foot ahead of the other and you keep moving, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you go back? You talked about these Zoom calls you're having. I mean, was that, did you have those before the pandemic or was that like a way that you, was that an example of one of the pivots that you made? I, I didn't know what Zoom was before the pandemic. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, we, we used to do like, uh, what was it? A go-to meeting or something like that. That was kind right, of our thing. Right. Uh, you know, so Zoom became the thing. And so Zoom calls uh, became uh, the thing. And we have always done events uh, at Busboys and Poets, always had authors and, you know, change makers and, you know, big names and in, in, in different fields, including peace and justice and all of that. And there are people that were, would frequent our, our, our places, whether they're coming to talk or they're coming to meet someone or have dinner or whatever. Uh, and so when this stopped, that was a huge part of what we do, you know, it, it, it was in a way what we we're about. And, um, we sat around and tried to figure out how can we re kind of invent those things in a way that that really makes sense in today's world. You know, we can, you know, we are one of our, uh, you know, in our tribal statement, we said we are a gathering place and gathering is not something that you're supposed to do these days. Right. So so uh, it, it became really tough to let go of that. So we created gatherings online, as you're doing here, um, where we have, you know, great authors, great speakers great change makers, peacemakers, and so on, uh, that I interview every Friday night. So every Friday, 6 p.m., we have an hour program that, you know, we have thousands of people tune in and enjoy. And so this has become kind of a, a regular thing. Uh, and I'm hoping to continue it even past this. In fact, we've had a lot of our customers said, this is really cool. We really love this. We'll still come back to your place, you know, once you, you know, be fully open, have events. But we also like these kind of regular events on Friday nights that we can plan on and be able to sit there and watch with family and other people. So it's kind of cool. So we that's that become a thing for us uh, now. Andy, I know we have another question, but um, could you talk a bit about that gathering space, uh, the people that you have talked to? Because I know that that tells that tells a lot about the times in which we're living and to bring people in to give insight in terms of the season. You mean? Uh, who are the people or, or yeah or, just name a few of the people that has come and uh, come come through uh, through the zoom calls yes yeah well the, the the i i started i think our first guest was lonnie bunch who is the head of the smithsonian uh institute uh he was also head of the african-american museum and then became the head of the fall home Paul, smithsonian he's a friend he's someone that we ended up having there then i had angela davis i had alice walker uh harry belafonte uh we had uh, Alicia Garza, we have, um, let's see, we have Cory Booker coming up this Friday, uh, Senator Cory Booker. We had, we'll have Nikki Giovanni. We had, um, gosh, uh, Ibram Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, um, Imani Perry. Uh, I mean, you, you name it, it's the who's who of, of peace and justice uh, and, and certainly issues that deal with race, deal with the current situation, the protests, the police defunding all those issues that people are talking about, elections, 
We had Michael Moore the other day. Uh, you know, all of these things I think are of interest to people uh, these days, certainly, and uh, certainly to our customers, that's for sure. Um, and they've been really, really well received. And the conversations are wonderful and, and uh, enjoyable and fun and, and, uh, and very candid. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been great. Thank you for that. We have a question from Darius. Uh, I know Darius and goodness. So the students are coming in strong. Uh, what have you found to be the most challenging aspect of the restaurant business and how did you overcome it? Wow. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a people business, it's a high touch business, obviously. You know, have so many different uh, nodes where things can go wrong, uh, you know, or opportunities of interaction with a guest. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very complicated, it's, you know, restaurants are like a very complicated ecosystem, right? I mean, they touch so many different things. You have employment, you have um, nutrition, you have health, you have ecology, you have, uh, you know, a, a lot of different aspects uh, sort of come together under one, uh, you know, uh, roof, so to speak. And so there's a lot of different challenges that, that, that come about people are always the most exciting and the most challenging, you know, whether they're customers or whether they're employees. Uh, so making sure that we run a profitable operation and at the same time, making sure that we are, you know, taking care of our staff, making sure that they're, uh, you know, well-trained, well, -trained, well uh, cared for, they feel good about being there. All of those things I think are, are challenging and, and certainly, Prior to the pandemic, you know, uh, we were seeing a very strong economy, as, as, especially in the restaurant industry. Restaurants are opening every other day. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I remember the 14th Street Corridor take, for instance, in, down, in, in, in DC from like um, uh, Thomas Circle to, um, to Columbia Heights. When we moved there, there was probably, oh, maybe a dozen restaurants altogether. Now there's over a hundred. So you can see like the proliferation of restaurants has been enormous. And so that puts a lot of uh, pressure. Of course, you know, competition is, is very real and it's right there. And also competition for staff. So you have a lot of changes that start to, you have to adjust and constantly be able to uh, um, meet the challenges that you're facing. You want, you want the best staff, so you have to raise wages and make sure that you have this so that Cuts into profit margin. There's a lot of pressure of not raising prices, and so you got a lot of issues that you have to constantly be weighing and uh, and figuring out as you go. But I would say the most challenging part has always been the people. It's the most exciting, and at the same time, the most challenging. <laughs> we we've, we've got another question from um, from one of our 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 friends here, Camille Burt. Um, wants to know what's your educational background and did you have any experience working in, working in managing in restaurants before starting your own? Well, I, I actually went to, uh, to Catholic University. I got my uh, undergrad in um, pre-med. I started um, medical school at Howard University for uh, one semester and decided I really didn't want to do that. And uh, I was very young and it wasn't for me and, and I was just in a, in a state of mind that wasn't really conducive to sitting down and hunkering down and becoming a doctor. So I quit, I started waiting tables um, and because that's what you do when you don't know what to do sometimes, right? So I started waiting tables and I loved it. I loved waiting tables. I loved serving, I loved uh, the whole environment of the restaurants was just exciting for me. And I thought, you know what, maybe that could be a career avenue for me. Um, and then I started thinking in terms of, of, of that. Um, and then I, I also, I, uh, I studied conflict resolution at George Mason. And then of course I did my MBA at, uh, at Smith, but, uh, it was a, it was a very, you know, I'm, I'm very ADD. So I, I really need lots of different stimulus all the time. <laughs> different things have to happen in my life. And so I'm always looking for new challenges, uh, uh, and, and, Education was part of them. I always loved the restaurant business, but I always thought it didn't give me the intellectual stimulation that I needed. Uh, and that's why I had, I had the bookstore and I want to be around writers, people that do this kind of stuff. And that's why I went back to actually school because I really want that intellectual stimulation that I so desperately needed. Uh, and the restaurant business, you don't have to have it, you know, obviously, you know, uh, right. but 
but it was it was uh, for me it was necessary. It's part of the um, of being a full person for me is to have that. In another Q and A, um, this one person was chose to be anonymous, but it kind of goes back even further. It says, "Before you started your first business, how did you express your entrepreneurial spirit?" Oh, you know, I I am a a doer, so I figure things out and I and I make them happen, and so I I always uh, you know would would be you know like like for instance, I worked at a at a at a restaurant uh, that uh, was a small boutique restaurant in Capitol Hill. Uh, years and years ago, it's no longer there, but I was hired as a waiter. And I remember going in there and they were showing me around and they told me what I had to do and so on. And so I noticed that the bathroom uh, needed a paint job because it wasn't really that, it's a beautiful restaurant, but it needed, it needed some touch up. So the next day I bring a can of paint with me and I said, do you mind if I paint it? And I wanted some brownie points, but at the same time, I also wanted to make the bathroom look nice. So, so for me, it was like, okay, of course that brought like, eyebrows raised to the, to the manager saying like, who is this guy? And what, why, why is he interested in painting our bathroom? I said, what's his ulterior motive, right? Right, what's the ulterior motive? So for, for me, it was like, always, you know, look for opportunities to make things better, to figure better ways to do things. You know, I, I even looked at the flow of how we like were seating people and I made a suggestion to do it differently because I thought it would work so much better and so I accepted it. And so just having constant ideas and operating as if it's my own business. You know, no matter where I've worked, I've always operated as if it's my own business. I always say that, that um, a, if, you, if you want, if a good boss has to be always a good employee. Like if, 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 if you're not a good employee, you're gonna make a lousy boss. Uh, that's my, my opinion. You know, I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly I, from my I, I subscribe to that, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got questions coming in, and I love this energy that's coming in. So let's continue. Um, hi, Shade, by the way. Uh, with the increase in competition along the years and continuous pivot, what have you what have you remained true to over the years? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think for for me, I, I you know. Restaurants don't have a mission statement. Most restaurants open up because they want to just feed people, right? Uh, we decided that early on, we really wanted to have what we, what we called not a mission statement, not a vision, but a tribal statement. We thought, you know, we are a group of people who have shared values, shared interests. We are a tribe. And so we, we decided to create a tribal statement. Our tribal statement really kind of gives us a sort of North Star, the constant focus of where we want to be. So whenever an issue comes up or something like that, we always refer back to that. Uh, so we are a place where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted. We talk about that all the time. What does that mean? What does that look like? How, does it, how do we incorporate it into everything we do? Uh, we are a place where art, culture, and politics intentionally collide. We talked about that. You know, how do you create that kind of collision? Uh, an opportunity for interaction for those things to come together. Uh, we are a place to take a deliberate pause. Uh, you know, we want people to come and linger. We don't rush them. We don't make them leave. You know, sometimes people come and have one cup of coffee and stay for hours writing the next great American novel or whatever they write, you know, uh, that's really cool also. Uh, and we believe by creating spaces like this, you can actually begin to uh, create a transformation in your in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, in your world. I mean, I think that's how I, that's how I've always uh, seen it as that's my focus. And race has always been really at the forefront for everything that I do, uh, because I know race is such a significant part of American culture. I noticed that from the minute that our plane landed into this country, uh, and I've noticed it every single time, and I've always said that the, in order for this country to move forward, race has to be at the forefront uh, of, of, a, of, of, of a conversation at least, and certainly uh, finding solutions to come forward on that issue of race and not keep sweeping it under the carpet. So when we first opened, we started a, uh, a conversation on race that still continues till today um, uh, online. Um, so this conversation is talking about race and how does race impact us. So that's always been kind of my focus as well, really, when I uh, you know, operate the people we hire, the way we operate, all that has uh, has a very strong racial component uh, attached to it. You know, uh, and I'm going to move to another question that I was going to ask later on, but you're touching on it, and it's important that the essence of race 
you know, with uh, the season of George Floyd and all of these things that are happening, um, thanks to Michelle and, and Judy, we uh, organized a, a panel with Black business owners uh, just to talk about their pain points and, um, you know, what's going on basically as being Black, but also during the season of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about, um, as an immigrant from Iraq, what are some problems that you have experienced or have seen to occur for ethnic restaurants in D.C. and Maryland? Oh, you know, uh, I've, I've been in this country for a real long time. So, so for me, I mean, I, I, I am an immigrant, absolutely. Um, I have a, a, a real interest in making sure that immigrants uh, get their fair share of what's going on in this country because they are part of the very fabric of what America is about. Um, so when uh, we early on, when when this president uh, took over, he was disparaging many immigrants and talking really really badly about about many many different communities. And uh, we did um, we did something called a day without immigrants, where we closed all of our restaurants for one day, uh, and uh, and just to kind of show people like uh, if you don't have folks who are immigrants who are here in this country trying to you know, just eke out a living, uh, you, uh, this country is, is not what, what it's supposed to be, you know? Uh, and so we, when we closed, it was, it was a, a, a moment to reflect, a moment to have a conversation about the issue, a moment to highlight the significance and the contribution of immigrants, especially in my industry, in the restaurant industry, for sure. Uh, and so that was, that was kind of a, a, a big thing for us. Um, we, we do lots of programming and events around these issues as well. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a constant, it's a constant, it's a constant struggle. And I think one of the best things we could do, uh, right now for immigrants to go out and vote and get this person out of the white house, I think that would be a really useful, um, approach. So we're, we're working a lot on election, uh, on, uh, on the election. Andy, you hesitated. <laughs> I, I, what? I hesitated. No, I, I, yeah, exactly. I tried to use uh, words that are that you are did not, well that are not going to be bleeped. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so so we're we're working on on uh, on sort of motivating people to go out and vote. We'll be doing a lot of uh, debate watches, uh, lots of conversations around the issues. Uh, really, kind of get people to focus on um, on getting out there and making sure that uh, they are heard. Because I don't know, another four years of this, I'm not sure where we'll be, but, but that's my opinion. I'm sure there are people on this call who may be thinking otherwise. We have, we have a couple of questions, but I just have one more question, then I'm gonna ask, and we'll, we'll um, get the student's questions in. Um, and I, by the way, I, I, I always thought, you know, I, I think, I don't know whether they teach you this in business school or not, but they always say like, leave politics out of whatever you do. I don't believe that in one bit. So for me, it's like politics are really, really important. They're part of our life. And if we pretend like uh, that we're not living in a political world, then we're just kind of either lying or fooling ourselves. So for me, I um, I feel like it's important as a you business have to. person, no, as a you business have person to. to make your voice uh, clear and let people know where you stand, um, and and let the chips fall where they may. It it sets the frame for everything it that we do. Does. It does. In fact, uh, we had a diversity session not too long ago, and. Uh, the new trend for diversity uh, momentum building is actually bringing politics into the workplace and you actually have to respect people's thoughts and opinions. And so, and I'm glad that does exist because you're bringing the fullness of who you are. But well, yeah, I, I, the, the new generation, uh, you know, the millennials especially, they have their opinions. They wear them on their sleeve. They're, they're like, they'll tell you exactly what they think, you know. So, so it's, it's really important uh, for people to even feel okay about being in, in a space to have, to bring out those issues. It makes people feel like they're fully human. They can bring their full selves there. I, I, I remember, you know, the, the thing with, the, with tattoos. I'm of the generation that if you had a tattoo, you're supposed to cover it up and not show it, you know, like when you're in, 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 in the workplace. Um, and so I remember having a, a session where I do like an orientation sometimes with our staff. And there was this one guy who was applying to be a manager. It was Summer. And he's wearing like a long sleeve shirt. And I knew what, the, what that's all about. I actually love tattoos. Uh, so I, I, said, uh, I said to him in the conversation, I said, can you roll up your sleeve? And he was like, like oh, shit. 
you know, I got caught. I said, no, I want to really see your tattoo. I'm sure it's beautiful. Like, you know, so he rolled up his sleeves and, and he was so proud to explain to me everything that was on it. And ever since he was wearing short sleeves the entire time. And every time I saw him, I was like so excited to like know that he can actually show his tattoo in a workplace. It was like, wow, uh, you know, things are changing and I'm glad, you know. That yeah, and I, and I bet you he served your, the customers even with a bigger smile. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the, you know, if, if you have piercings, if you have, you know, a lot of people like when they go to an interview, they take out their piercings and all that, but you can still see the holes, you know? So, so people like, it's like, I know there's a hole there. There was a ring or something there. Keep it next time. Don't take it's it off. Fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. It's your thing. It's interesting to me that even at Bus Boys and Poets, someone would think that they could, was this a Bus Boys where they felt they couldn't show yeah, their tattoos? This, this was probably like 10 years ago. Uh, okay. but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, and people don't know, like, especially like when they're meeting the owner. They think yeah. like the owner is like the stuffy guy who's going to be like, you know, concerned about their piercings or their tattoos or whatever. But, you know, no. Okay, okay let me get some of these questions. Okay, Chloe, I think it's powerful that you're politically involved with your company. Has it ever had a negative effect on your business? And if so, how did you handle that? Um, we've had issues, uh, obviously. We've, we've had issues. We've had ICE raids. Uh, the immigration uh, service has raided us. Um, uh, not not in, a, you know, in a way where they had like trucks and people taking, you know, being hauled away, but they, we've been like, you know, targeted. Um, so that's been an issue at some level. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've had customers come in and say, I will never come back to your place because of the politics. Uh, they didn't realize that it was a political space and therefore they say, I just want to come and eat dinner. Like, what the hell? Why are you like, what is it like, uh, you know, shoving this in my face, you know? Uh, sometimes we'll show things on, on, on the video or we may have some art there that might, you know, represent a certain something or another that may offend somebody. So, you know, I, I try to engage them at some level, but, you know, I also stay true to what we're doing. And if, you know, um, I mean, we're, Look, we're fortunate we live in a community that is very, for the most part, progressive. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of people that come in and say, oh, why do you have a picture of, you know, Martin Luther King on the wall? Like, we don't like him, you know, like we don't have that uh, so much here uh, in this area. Um, and, I, and I suspect that, let's say if I had a place in, I don't know, some conservative town somewhere, I wouldn't, I, first of all, I, I wouldn't do it. Like, you know, so it's not like trying to change people as so much as it is trying to just plant your flag. That's all it is. It's, it's really not about like, I think there's a lot of subtle messages that we can send out to people that are like, who may not be political, who may be open to ideas. I think that's really great. You know, sometimes people do come in there and learn something and walk away, you know, different. Um, that's that's wonderful but if, if you know a true you know trump supporter is not going to love our place in a in a, in a in a in a sense although i have a i have a short story that i want to tell you so mm -hmm. around the inauguration uh during the inauguration of this president um there were three guys that walked in uh that uh, had uh the maga hats make america great uh, again hats they happened to be in town for the inauguration and they were just looking for a restaurant. They saw the first you know, place, I guess, they ran into it. They decided to walk in. And when they walked in, it took them, you could see it because we watched this on video afterwards. You could see them like pausing and kind of looking around, thinking like, where are we here? You know, because the art, the people and so on is a little different than what they're probably expecting. And so they took their hats off and put it under their arms. It was really funny. And then they got seated, uh, you know, and a black waitress, uh, uh, was uh, was helping them was uh, was serving them and she was really nice and wonderful to them and they started you know you could see they got more animated and engaged with her and they were like having exchange and um at the end at the end you know they had really wonderful service they they left a note saying uh despite the fact that we may have different politics or different at this you know uh racial backgrounds or whatever uh we can all come together and be americans thank you for making us feel so comfortable and uh, they left her a $450 tip. What? Yes, on a, on a, on a $70 check. 
and uh, and and so we tweeted it out, and of course the press was looking for stories that were uplifting at that time. They still are. They <laughs> uh, they they were looking for, the, and so we we got contacted by lots of press and people were interviewing this young woman. Uh, her name is Rosalind, and she was she was being interviewed all the time by these like newspapers and magazines and New York Times and TVs and all this. Like it was a huge story. And uh, the New York Times said, well, how do we know you, this is in bogus? Like you didn't like make this up to get publicity. I said, well, that's not what we do. But, but they, 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 so they, they took it, they hired an investigator to find out who actually was the person. Uh, you know, <laughs> if they had put as much effort in the war in Iraq, we probably right. wouldn't have gone there. But anyway, uh, so, so, they, so they hired somebody, they found the guy, because we don't have his name and we only have the last four numbers of the credit card, you know? So it's like really hard to find out where, where that person is. Um, and so, so they, they, uh, they tracked him down somewhere in Texas. He's a, a dentist in Texas. And they did a Zoom, uh, uh, a go-to meeting, I guess, that, whatever it was. Uh, they did it like a, like a conversation. A Skype. It was a Skype meeting. They did a Skype meeting with him and you could see, you could still actually look it up. You can find it on, on, on YouTube, I think but he was like in tears talking about the amount of love and care that he received and how it was so incredible for him. And it was like, it was a little bit mind blowing, frankly, that it's, it's, it's probably the first black woman he's ever encountered at such a close range, you know? Uh, and, and so for him, it was like a shock because all he knows is what he sees maybe on Fox News or whatever else he gets his news from that don't always you know, provide a more fair assessment of what people are. And so I think it was really funny and very telling how, how these moments of interacting with one another have such a transformative impact on people sometimes. And we tend to not put as much um, credence in those moments, but I think it, it's, there, there, there's something there about spaces that bring people together that have unintended, uh, you know, sometimes, ex you know, unintended consequences. Unintended consequences sometimes, uh, you know, where people unexpectedly find moments of that liminal space that brings them together in a, in a, in a different way. Well, that's, uh, boy, I think that would have been uh, a moment of, wow, this is why I founded this entire thing all together. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. It was a real moment. I, I agree with you. Judy, do we have questions? Yeah, we do, actually. This one is somewhat um, actually tied to the story you just told. Um, it's from Andrew Yannick. He says he's a veteran of the hospitality industry himself. And he, he is talking about the importance of organizational culture and day-to-day -day operation. And that, to me, ties to the fact that this woman gave those customers such care and such attention, right? Yeah. And so he says, what do you do to get your teams and managers to buy into your culture? And is there anything that you do to continue to keep your associates engaged? Well, that's, that's an excellent question as well. I think one thing that I've done that I really kind of take pride in, and I, I haven't done it uh, as much now during this pandemic because we've been kind of going through lots of transitions at this moment, but um, I, I do these um, orientations uh, with, with our staff that I lead and their uh, conversations on race. And, um, you know, it's um, uh, everybody that gets hired for the front of the house, especially, uh, for the front of the house gets to attend these meetings. And so uh, they're asked, uh, you know, by their managers to show up at a certain time to meet the owner, talk about an orientation. And most of the time they have no idea what they're there for. They think, well, I'm going to just tell them about how, uh, you know, to serve uh, coffee or do whatever, you know, they're supposed to do. But we end up having this very deep, intelligent, fantastic conversation on race. And um, it really is uh, an exciting um, uh, experience for many people. And, uh, you know, we have, of course, a lot of young people that, that work in our spaces. And uh, I remember for years, people would say, you know, young people are like over this, like, you know, they've moved on, like you're trying to bring your own generation's, uh, you know, baggage into this. But no, they haven't moved on. We see it now clearly on the streets, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because because we haven't moved on as a, as, a, as a country. So for us to say, you know, that young people don't see race or don't recognize race or don't think of race uh, is just foolish. Uh, and clearly we're seeing it play out. Uh, and it's inevitably one of the uh, most um, uh, appreciated conversations by our staff 
uh, many that have exit interviews uh, sometimes will say that's probably one of the most exciting things that they had ever attended in any workplace ever. Like, wow. you know, like seriously, they say this over and over again. First of all, it's done by the owner. Like how many people go to a, a, a fairly sizable corporation, get to meet the owner and talk about race? You know, that never happens. That's usually, uh, uh, it's a, a diversity training program that is led by HR that becomes like this sort of like, it's almost like going to the dentist, you know? So uh, that's not, it's, this is the opposite of that. This is like deep dive, exciting, political, rich, you know, oh, okay. loud, uh, <laughs> exciting, you know, like Authentic. conversation. Yeah. yeah, really, it's so amazing. You know, I love it because every single time we have, it's a new conversation. It's a brand new conversation every single time because you have a different mix of people and they at, at at the table. And so, and is and how and is the day really about race or is it about? I mean, what else is it about? Is it about race? Well, it starts out with race because I I don't want to water down race. You know, we can we, we we can call it diversity and start talking about you know different disabilities and different LGBTQ stuff and all this stuff. But we really focus on race and then it goes into different directions as needed. You know, but but I always bring it into the race as the first and foremost conversation that I would like to have, uh, mainly because of my own experience with race mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think also I see this country was so desperate. It still is so desperate in need of having this conversation and, and not just a conversation, but actually a, a, a way forward. Uh, and, and we've sort of kicked this can down the road over and over again, hoping that someday this will get lost. Like people will just not remember the can, you know, like, no, the can right. will be there. Right. We keep picking it and it's gonna come back to us, roll back at us one way or the other. And, uh, and we're seeing this and I, I'm hoping we're in a moment where actually we've sort of are moving in that direction, but I'm not convinced. I think it's gonna take a lot more moments uh, for us to be able to move forward because we put a lid on this for 400 years. It's not gonna just, you know, suddenly a pandemic and two months later and we're combining. No, that's not gonna no. happen. No. I think it's gonna take a lot more effort, a lot more time and a lot more competency, I think, especially for the predominant culture here in this country, which is the white culture, to be able to uh, start really reflecting on, 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 you know, inwards a little bit more. I think that's the problem is like white people don't have to reflect inwards. They just have, the world is theirs, so they own it. Uh, but, but that inner reflection, I think it's starting to happen. You're seeing it in some moments, but I hope it's more than just, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, and, uh, you know, a couple of buttons and a couple of bumper stickers and we move on, you know. And, and there are people who are not even there yet. They're not absolutely, even there. Absolutely. You know? I, I always say like, if there's one silver lining to this administration is that it really brought out that muck that needed to be brought out from under the surface because it was always there and it wasn't gonna disappear. Uh, so for, for, for that to happen, I think was a service, was something good that happened. And, and I think with the Obama administration, we thought that, oh, we're, we're okay. But right, right, right. We're not, yeah, we're not, yeah, exactly. we're not okay. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, um, um, well, you brought up so much just now. I think that the moment that I would, uh, what I just would like to just applaud you for saying is the element of uh, having talk about this. And we just had a dialogue uh, right before this session uh, talking about diversity issues and uh, Jeanette, who is on this uh, Zoom experience, uh, basically said, you know, the idea of us saying that we're uncomfortable talking about this is actually now pissing people off because, you know, with, with Black people saying, you know, I, I'm not uh, uncomfortable talking and neither should you be. And so um, we, we, we changed it from a, t a title of uh, uncomfortable conversations to critical, critical right, conversations. Right, You're going to have right. to talk. <laughs> so I love your onboarding yeah. idea. I think if critical, every organization yeah. takes that, yeah. that would be awesome. Conversations we must have. Yep. Uh, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and I think I think um, you know there are moments that happen like what we're in now, where it's it's a window, and and the, and the window will close, and so we really have to capture it. And I think there's a fear of talking about race in this country. Uh, I know. Uh, I think for many reasons, uh, and 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 some of them are good reasons. You know, there's 
legal stuff you can you know find yourself deep into there's uh, you know personal stuff that you can find yourself deep into there's uh, you know you're putting yourself out on a limb you know you say the wrong word and suddenly you become stamped with one thing or another you know so it's really hard to have this conversation I have to tell you it's it's not an easy conversation so it is difficult in that sense because people are not very forgiven uh, forgiving uh, mm -hmm. you know when, when it comes to these issues these days uh, and I think, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of prevents you from wanting to uh, dive deep into it. Uh, you know, you always, everybody's walking on eggshells and trying to yeah. be as, as, you know, as less committed as, you know, committal as possible. I, I find it, I, I love the conversation. I think partly because I don't identify as white and I don't identify as black. So it gives me that sort of like kind of perch that I can say what I want, express myself in a, in a, in a way, and it, it's sincere, and it comes across that way. And, it's, and it, for whatever reason, I have not gotten in trouble. And I've been doing this for like 15 years, like constantly, every single two weeks, you know? So we've done hundreds of these. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've had one walkout, but that's about it, you know? But, but that's all, you know? You know, I, I also think that, first of all, I was going to say to Victor's point, we, we need to get over the, that being uncomfortable is a problem, right? Good point. It's okay to be uncomfortable. And two, we just don't have good practice. So it's like when you're yes. in your first relationship, we don't know yes. how to fight properly. Absolutely. We don't know how to have these comps. So we've just got to start practicing. So you're giving a lot of young people really incredible practice there, Andy. Well, the, the mid nineties really screwed us up. I have to say, because this diversity training that was became an industry, and and suddenly like everybody was doing diversity training and the diversity training was so bad and so uh so uh, uh uh irrelevant uh to what really needs to be talked about that it turned people off you know it it made white people feel really good about themselves and as if they needed to feel any better about themselves and it made other people brown and black people feel like they've just been cheated mm -hmm. uh, uh you know so i think it it really did a disservice and we thought we were doing the right thing right i mean we as Somebody you know did. the predominant culture uh you know was, and that became like the norm for years right i mean until fairly recently people really didn't even say the word race sometimes during these conversations you know uh which made no sense whatsoever and everybody wanted to hop skip over you know the essence of racism in this country which starts with slavery which starts back in 1619 which starts with all that stuff and, and uh, that really um, made, made a lot of people tune out. So, so for the black people that were sitting in the audience or the brown people that are sitting in the audience, they just started to shut down and said, I'm just gonna sit here and hunker down and say, yeah, I went and, and I attended this list because HR tells me I have to. And the white people went home like teary eyed thinking that they've just accomplished like an incredible experience. Uh, and uh, everybody thinks they're all happy and no one was happy. I mean white people were but nobody else was yeah. um yeah yeah this is so good i'm telling i'm getting so many texts like this is so good preach this is a great conversation <laughs> but anyway um I, I i want to make sure that we uh, uh, uh to get through our list judy um let me just ask you this question andy <clears throat> um what are some of the recommendations maybe do's and don'ts that you would give entrepreneurs and small business owners uh, that are trying to make their business survive during this uh, pandemic. Don't panic. I mean, I know that's that's a hard thing to tell people, right? It's like if you're drowning, or if you if you if you get thrown in the water, the first thing they tell you is don't panic, because the minute you panic, you're gone, right? So, as someone who's been in business for a long time, I can assure you that this too shall pass. And sometimes when we're in the middle of something like this, we think the world has ended. And, and I know for some people, it's hard, it's hard to even imagine a different world. There are many ways of being able to um, sustain yourself between now and whenever this is over, uh, like over, over. Um, and I think there are, try to find as many ways possible. And I would say TAP, the, S, the Small Business Administration is one of the best resources that this country has if you think that government is useless, uh, uh, you know, just look at the SBA. 
Uh, the Small Business Administration is an incredible, incredible resource. Uh, I got my first loan from the Small Business Administration. They've always been there whenever I've asked for anything. They're very, very helpful. Um, so I, I would say, you know, just focus on that and use this moment to like really kind of, you know, if you have a business that's been running for a long time, always wanted to make some changes or make something, some different, but because you're running so fast, you couldn't, this is the moment to do it. For us, we really built our technology in a huge way, knowing that that's going to be an important part of our business model, right? So we spend a lot of time and effort building our technology during this time. We have looked at efficiency. We have gotten so much more efficient in this, in, 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 in this time that, that we've been in. That's been an incredible opportunity, really, to sort of hone in, find areas that we thought we were, you know, that, that, that really didn't need to happen, that we just kept building, building, building over time. So that's given us an opportunity. Like how many times does a business get to like say, okay, start over, everybody at the same time. Like that's not gonna happen anytime soon, I hope. Uh, so this is a moment I think that shouldn't be squandered. Um, so we're really looking at it as an opportunity to see what we could do better. Now I'm saying that, but there are businesses that are strapped for cash that don't have enough, enough to be able to even pause and make that decision and so on. And I think that's gonna be really, really tough for, for some folks. I mean, I know that at least, you know, according to the restaurant association, about 30% of the restaurants are not coming back. And I'm, I'm just speaking about restaurants, of course, that's my business uh, area. Um, Yelp did a survey. They said 60% of restaurants uh, through Yelp said they're not coming back. So it's gonna be a different world uh, re-entering. But I also believe, like I really do believe that this there are opportunities that are going to open up uh, if you're able to do that. That are that are going to be you know once in a lifetime kind of opportunities. We're going to be. Uh, I I just finished signing papers for Baltimore and for Columbia, Maryland. So in the midst of all this, you know, uh, I mean, people are saying like, "Well, wow, this is not the time to talk." Now you have to negotiate really good leases because uh, landlords are motivated right now. Uh, for the first time, for the first time in what? 30 some odd years I've been in business um, that I have the upper hand over my landlords. <laughs> That's, that, that, that feels so good. <laughs> That's, but, but yeah, because, because landlords are, you know, obviously people go out of, of business. They can't do anything about it. There's bankruptcies. There's all kinds of stuff. They're, they're going to be mired in, in, uh, in, in legal stuff for a long time. So they want to be able to cut deals and get it over with and move on. And so that's been that's been a great opportunity also to be able to renegotiate uh, with with landlords like you know do you want me to go out of business or would you like to strike a better deal and most of the time they probably want to strike a better deal so there's opportunities there as well. Andy J uh, Janice says yes to Columbia Maryland I am waiting for you. <laughs> is, is that Janice from my cohort? I. I don't think so. It's Janice Walker no, Imiogo. Okay. I don't think, no, okay. not Janice Green. If you're thinking Janice Green, <laughs> no, yeah. not yeah. Janice yeah. Green. Yeah. Um, yeah, so somebody actually just posted um, something from the Maryland Small Business Development Co Corporation. Did you interact with them? As I think they're part of, um, or funded by us. Yeah, I did, I did. Yeah, they're, they're actually not far from the University of Maryland campus. Right. Uh, yeah, they're, they're great. They're really, really good. They're part of the SBA, yep. We are so glad to hear that because we actually, just so folks know, um, SBDC, they're called Small Business yeah. Development Corporation. They yeah. offer a lot of free consulting. Absolutely. So they will come to your company. They will Absolutely. Help, can Absolutely. help you, give you a lot of consulting. And they've been partnering with us on this webinar series. Absolutely. So we've they're been really good. glad to have them. They're very good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear that because we have, um, we've been really happy with being, having the opportunity to work with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're very good. Um, that's awesome. What else, Victor, do we want to ask Andy about? Oh, we have some more questions. Let me just go ahead and um, re uh, read them for you. I want to make sure I honor all these questions. So, how is Smith? Okay, how is Smith teaching changing now to reflect what is going on in our society? 
I don't know if Andy can answer that question. Okay, <laughs> I will answer that question. Oh, well, good. Andy, 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 Andy. Something. I have no idea. <laughs> well, Andy, Andy, so I'll just answer briefly because we want to focus on Andy, but we are, um, we are looking in, in a variety of our programs, and Victor, you probably know this better than I do. Um, go, Victor. Well, I thought he was asking uh, Andy. <laughs> well, like, you're doing the focus groups, which is great. Uh, you're, you're asking people to give feedback of how you can do better, right? As, as, in light of what's happening today, the protests, the Black Lives Matter stuff. Oh, right? okay. I, I, so, so I think that's really an important shift uh, for, for a school. Uh, to really start focusing on understanding that you can't divorce business from the real world. I mean, you know, there's, you know, you have to mix the two, right? And, uh, you know, focusing on race and how it impacts business, how it impacts your, your, your decision making, how, you know, all of those things I think are really important. And I think that's, you know, kudos to the, to the school for, for, for bringing people together to even consider having that kind of conversation. You know, I, uh, I'm very happy. I just got confused. Like, why are they asking Andy that question? But, uh, but I'm very happy to answer. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of things going on even before the pandemic. You know, Smith teaches how to, we teach about it, and now we're going to have to live what we've been teaching, which is the managing complexity and chaos, which is where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Because just learning formulas uh, and principles is just not enough in this day and time. You got to think critically. You got to analyze. You got to understand what pivoting is, and you got to come up with things that you've never come up with before. And so, I think that Smith has done a good job in teaching it. Now we're telling our students now live what we've taught you. I think with race and business, uh, we have a way to go. We actually are in conversations now in terms of um, it just makes no sense to have two parallel uh, learning moments: uh, diversity and everyday learning. Uh, it has to jive together. And that's what Smith is actually doing now. Our undergraduate curriculum, we're starting from scratch, is a good time for us to just look at how can we incorporate it from the moment of freshman walk into the door. Uh, so Smith is definitely moving in the right direction, but certainly we, along with all educational institutions and organizations, have some work to do. And I think also we, we have, and, 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 I, and I hope this doesn't come across uh, in, in the wrong way, we have been led sometimes to believe that business has the answers to everything and business is there to be business okay there is of course some responsibilities that go along with that but it should not uh, government should not abdicate its responsibilities and hand it over to business and i think sometimes we try to teach that you know if government messes up like we can have business come and fix it no yeah you know that's not, that's not, you know, a government is there for a purpose, you know, it's for the common good. Business is not there for the common good. Business is there to serve the customer that they want to serve. And I think it's, it's a very different mindset that we have been led to believe in this country as if government is bad and business has all the answers. And I don't believe that's necessarily true. I think business can be helpful, but certainly is not a replacement to government. And I think that's sometimes it feels like where we're heading, and that shouldn't be. Very well said. Andy, um, do you, um, this is just a, a, a question, but do you ever panic? You know, I have been blessed, with, as, as my wife says, you have a good nerve system, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and I, I, I don't do a lot of panic. I really don't. I, I have learned that as a leader, panic is a terrible thing to have as a as an attribute you know uh because you affect and impact so many people so i have uh been able to I mean, and 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 maybe that's the that's the uh starting point um is is whatever happens no matter how terrible it is there's always a way out and there's always a solution to it right it's always going to at some point it will you know come to an end and, and you'll solve it somehow and you'll be better for it you'll you'll learn something you will you will you know achieve a higher level of understanding of something so like you know we've had floods we've had fires we've had ceilings fall we've had uh you you name it i mean everything and pandemics <laughs> um and i think I think panic is, is, uh, is something that when you're new in business, maybe that's something that you might, you know, uh, fall into. But I think uh, after a while you realize that 
when you panic, you don't make the best decisions and you don't really use the moment to learn from it. You know, you end up being mired, uh, mired into the, the chaos and the panic and not really focusing on, okay, this happened. Let me see what I'm, what I'm observing right now. Let me see what I could do better next time this happens because it may happen again. Uh, and that helps you to, to improve. So I know in a, in a, in a word, I, I, I don't panic. Well, I, I knew you were going to say something like that. I'm just thinking we probably should have called, you know, don't panic, just pivot, you know. Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That should have been the name of our, our seminar, Judy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. if, we, if, if we have another um, pandemic, that's what we'll name it. Pandemic, exactly. don't panic, well, just pivot. It's funny, I've always told my managers, I said, we as leaders, you don't have the luxury of being in a bad mood. You don't have the luxury to panic. You know, if you're if you're a dishwasher and you're a cook and you're in a bad mood, you may affect the person standing next to you. And that's about it. But if you're a leader and you're leading a group of people, if you are in a bad mood, you affect everybody. And so we don't have the luxury. That luxury is out the window the minute you chose to be a leader. Yeah. Um, you know, this so this semin this webinar is part of um, a free education program, this Maryland um, business yeah, rebooted. rebooted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our goal was to provide entrepreneurs, business owners, and even um, individuals with some information or education that will help them during this time of pandemic. So as an alum of the Smith School of Business and having done your MBA here, we um, tell us from your perspective, I and mean, we're, we're covering things like strategy, accounting, digital marketing. We're going to have a series on retailing in the, in the spring. Could you tell us what important areas or topics um, you think people should focus on um, as they try to kind of skill up either for their employment or as a business owner? And maybe those are two different answers. One of the most important uh, um, uh, areas of, of, of study, I think, that I benefited from was accounting. Um, uh, most people that go into business, oftentimes, um, you know, they may have inherited something or you know, decided let's open a restaurant. They may have, you know, they may be like have some kind of degree in something, but has nothing to do with business. And, and you know, always, always kind of like didn't think of accounting as being all that important. It was like if you take in more than you spend, then you're doing okay. You know, like that's that's the that's the basic, which it works. I mean, it it definitely works. Um, I like I said, I didn't get my MBA till I was like just a few years ago. Uh, and and uh, what it was it two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, but it was, it was, uh, but I was still successful, right? I, I, I understood some of the basics, but I wasn't really very focused on the finer details of my PL statement, my balance sheet, my, you know, cash flow statement. Uh, once I learned those, a whole world opened up. It's like, it's like, duh! you know, it's like I started seeing things in 3D and in color. And it's like, oh my goodness, every number has meaning. It's like, oh, I don't have to just look at the very bottom line. I can look at all the other stuff and really understand it and engage with my, with my, you know, finance guy and be able to have a conversation with them, you know? So that Did it was- change how you, how you managed some things in your restaurant? What was that? Did it change how you managed? Something? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I look at numbers really closely now, much more so than I ever did. And I, you know, you know, we we put, we have we have we, we have different measurements now, different, uh, you know, you know, key indicators and all of that. So it's it's a lot of changes that have happened. And also, I think one of the other things I think has helped me is really kind of to look at data. Uh, that a lot of times we tend to do things through intuition, uh, mm -hmm. certainly if you're in business and that's, you know, a lot of successful entrepreneurs and business people do that and they do it very well. But sometimes, you know, if you're going to scale up, if you're going to be able to, you know, grow, if you're going to go in new markets that you may not have the intuition to understand, uh, then, then I think it's uh, important to have the data uh, there to be able to look at. Uh, so, yeah, so looking at data, uh, looking at systems, that was really that was really important to understand systems, uh, system flow, uh, understand the economics of, of business was really cool. I I, I would say the the uh, the learning I did was invaluable. Now I wish I had done it maybe five years earlier, not much more. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to do this 
at the beginning and then go into business because then you end up being stuck in this sort of like forever looking at numbers and stuff like that. You never do it. Uh, you know, it's good to do it and then get the, the MBA and then be able to, to use it uh, after the practical. But you know, but after listening to your, your whole talk, it wasn't your time. It was, it was Andy's season to do it what? Absolutely. At that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I, I, I have agree. one. I agree. I have one final question for you, um, and this is just just reading up on you, and I just wanted you to respond. So, um, I love the fact that you founded the Peace Ball, and if you just talk a little bit about that, just I just love hearing that story. And then, but here's what I uh, read: um, that in a program, uh, you helped me understand that he included in the evening's program a poem from the man who inspired the name of the restaurants, Langston Hughes, perhaps a response to the slogan trademarked by Donald Trump. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America, America again. again. Yeah. Uh, so this is from Let America Be America Again uh, by Langston Hughes. Uh, one, of the, one of the best poems uh, he had written and it was written in the mid uh, uh, 1930s, and uh, it was uh, it's it's actually etched at the top of our um, one of our murals at our 14th Street location. And what amazed me about it, and I think I think I I, I feel you know a certain kinship to Langston Hughes in, in in some ways, is that here is a black man who lived here in the early part of the 20th century, uh, and where Jim Crow was alive and well and that uh, de facto apartheid and segregation was very much part of this country's uh, DNA. Uh, and yet he found hope in a, such an incredible, it was, was just beyond uh, my imagination, frankly. And so he, he, he says, he's a, let America be America again, let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane seeking a home where he himself is free. America was never America to me. Uh, let America be the dream, the dreamer's dream. Let it be the strong land of love where neither kings connive nor tyrants scheme that no man be crushed by one above. So he, he spoke about an America that was like a fantasy, right? Uh, that he never experienced. And he kept saying, America was never America to me, but he saw the possibilities of America, you know? And as uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones speaks, she says, black people in this country are really the ones that are ho holding America to its ideals. It was black people that the 14th Amendment came about. And because of the 14th Amendment, you were able to have gay marriage. Like it, it's all interconnected in such a beautiful way, you know? Uh, so, so all of these things really created the America that was possible, the one that Langston Hughes speaks about and let America be America again. Absolutely. Um, the, and, and the Peace Ball? Uh, the Peace Ball came about when we had just opened recently, and uh, the Obama uh, campaign was actually heating up uh, at that time, and we started working on the Obama campaign, uh, and we spent a lot of time and effort and money, uh, raised tons of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars we raised through Busboys and Poets to, uh, for the campaign. We took buses and went to Ohio and did this canvassing in Ohio and Virginia and other places. And um, once he won, uh, you know, they, 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 I remember waking up the next morning thinking, oh, we have to have a ball, you know, and I've never been to, to an inaugural ball. I don't know what inaugural balls are. I don't know what people do in them. You know, I'd never been to one, um, you know, and so I, I said, but we need a ball for this, you know, and so we decided to go for it. And we, uh, you know, I, I called a few big names. I don't know if you know who Howard Zinn is. Howard Zinn uh, was the author of People's History of the United States, uh, who, who, who died, very important historian uh, in American history and American culture. And I called Howard and I said, Howard, uh, you know, I want you to be one of the co-hosts. And he said, okay, fine. You know, he said, but remember, Obama is a politician. You know, don't put all your hopes on him. And <laughs> fine, but for now, I am going to. And then we we had uh, I called uh, Harry Belafonte, and Harry Belafonte, I asked him to be also a co-host, and he said he'd love to do it. And so we had these two big titans, you know, at the top, uh, and then we started bringing people in, and we had everybody. We had, you know, the Alice Walkers, and we had the Nikki Giovannis, and we had the, 
we even had Jackson Brown, this <laughs> the, the singer. We had Angelique Cujo playing. We had uh, lots of really big, big names. And we rented a place, uh, the Postal Museum, over next to the uh, Union Station. We rented it, and we, we, you know, we it holds about maybe like 900 people or so. And we thought, God, we're not going to fill up 900 people. That's a lot of people. And we sold out like within like hours, literally. And 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 we ended up having to, uh, you know, stretch ourselves uh, to allow more people in. And and uh, it was an incredible, incredible evening. And so from then on, we started doing inaugural balls at each four years. So we did one in 2013 when Obama was inaugurated the second time. And then we decided for this one, we weren't sure who was going to win, right? Uh, it was Hillary or Trump. And we thought Hillary might win, Trump might win, whoever. Uh, but we had booked the African American Museum, which had just opened uh, that year. And we so we, we booked the museum. I said, I don't know who's going to win, but we're going to do a ball. And it's going to be either a ball of remembrance of the great things that we've done and moving forward or you know whatever you know so we so we decided to do that and a lot of people didn't do it because the you know people were so depressed after the election a lot of folks that we associate with certainly so there were not many opportunities so we had everybody like the who's who of everybody was there we had over 4000 people uh, at the oh African American Museum uh, you know, the whole museum was open for people to browse through. It just knew it was hard, even hard to get a ticket to see the museum, let alone to come to the ball. And uh, we had food, we had drinks, we had performances, we had everybody. We had everybody. Cher came. Like, you know, with like wow. <laughs> we had, we had, like, we had, uh, the, the, the headliner was uh, Solange. Uh, we had uh, everybody, like you, you name them, they were there. We had senators and congressmen and actors and movie stars and you name it. It was really, really a cool night. It was a night to remember. And we were actually, I was just getting ready to sign uh, the deal with the museum again to do it this coming uh, inauguration before the pandemic hit. And so we kind of everything went, everything went on hold because I don't think the museums will be open uh, or, or Having not for that, to right? Be a thing, uh, yeah. you know this uh, this inauguration. We'll have to go back to celebrating in the street. That's where I think I was outside Best Boys and Poets when Obama won the first time. Wasn't that an incredible night? Wow, that was an incredible night. That was yeah. memorable. Yeah. Well, so so we're going to be doing um, uh, the debate watch parties uh, inside the spaces, and you know with the social distancing, you know. So so we're so we're going to be doing that uh, in all all of our spaces. Um, this oh, that's good to know. September 29th is the first one. Wonderful. Yeah. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for the honor of me just having this conversation with you. I've learned so much about you and and uh, you've inspired me to keep doing what I do. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Judy. Thank um, you, be before we say goodbye, I do want to say thank you, but I also want to share our upcoming um, webinars. Andy mentioned how important accounting was. We're having the last accounting webinar next Tuesday, but the old ones are posted on our website. So if you want to take Andy's advice and get your accounting skills up to snuff, that's an opportunity. Um, starting September 30th, we've got three webinars about um, marketing from a colleague of mine who really focuses on what businesses can do, very practical, very hands-on. And then a lot of the topics that Andy mentioned as essential are part of our MicroMasters classes on the edX platform. So I just wanted to share this so people can see the other resources we have available. Um, go to our website, look up SBDC, take advantage of their resources. They are here to help you. They got a big part of the CARES Act funding and, um, and they are there for you. Andy. A final thank you so much. You're such a contributor. You give so much back to us here at Smith, and we really appreciate well, it. Well, I love the school. You've given me a lot. Thank you. Well, we're very happy to be here. And and, and um, Victor, thank you as well. It's great to be able to co-host with you today. See you later. All right. Take care. Yeah.